Hi, I'm Tony Williams, and this is Brooklyn Savvy. Hi, I'm Tony Williams, and welcome to this episode of Brooklyn Savvy. We're going to be talking about breastfeeding and the intersection of public policy, cultural norms, and community leadership with two fantastic experts. We have Dr. Aletha Maybank, your Assistant Commissioner of the uh, Department of Health, and then we have our Councilman Robert Cordigy. Who is a man. Who is a man? <laughs> hey, and a very tall man. <laughs> But we're going to be talking about something that's really important. And I thought that where we might want to start is, you know, the United States tops the charts in terms of stigma, in terms of breastfeeding and public breastfeeding. Would you care to comment on that, uh, Mr. Cornick? I think it's, it's tremendously un unfortunate that that's where we find ourselves, mm -hmm. as, as uh, supposed to be one of the most civilized and evolved uh, culturals, cultures. So um, I think. You know, it's very unfortunate that this is where we find ourselves. So uh, we have to step out mm -hmm. and really make a change. So what do you think is driving it? Well, I think there are many factors. Um, we have to look at history mm -hmm. uh, that drives, and when we look at communities of color, uh, especially in our rates, we might have really high initiation rates, so rates in which you know, we first start breastfeeding, but then they tend to drop. Off, right. um, where they're lower than uh, most communities uh, across the country. So the history of, we were talking earlier about slavery and how that's impacted and how many slaves actually had to breastfeed the white children. Absolutely. And yes. so when formula really came around, you know, in the 40s and 50s, then it was an idea and women were going to work and there were all these other policies that were actually supporting women uh, to go to work. It became a very affluent thing to have formula. Mm -hmm. And many African Americans then thought and strived to have formula and thought that would be the better thing and the best thing because that's what white women were able to do and mm -hmm. had access to. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we now have a situation in which um, many communities and many young people are very disconnected. They've never seen anybody breastfeed at all. Uh, and one of the times that, you know, I'm a pediatrician, mm -hmm. and naturally you would think that I was trained to really promote breastfeeding. At the time that I was a pediatrician, we really didn't have that strong message. We knew, yes, you say you can advocate for breastfeeding, but it didn't really happen. And what really struck me was uh, Katrina, mm -hmm. Hurricane Katrina. And there was a family that was stuck on the roof, and they had a one-week-old baby. By the time they got the baby, they had to take the baby to the emergency room and to the hospital. The baby died. The baby died of and dehydration. The, uh, this, yeah. Mom ran out of formula, but there was never that thought to put the baby on the breast to feed. Oh, wow, that's tragic. It is tragic. That's and so tragic. we have that level of disconnection. But then there are also policies that have really inhibited um, us as women, especially, to be able to breastfeed. We go to work, and right. it's challenging for many different reasons. And then we have the cultural and social norms. Um, around perceptions about what are breasts here for. Well, it was really interesting when I nursed, and you know, this is going back some 20 years ago, I made sure that my kids accepted the breast as well as the bottle because I felt very inhibited to nurse in public. Right. You know, and the first time that occurred to me, I was like, oh, I better get these kids on the bottle because I just do not feel comfortable sharing what I saw as an intimate moment. But as we've spoken about be prior to the show, that was like mental conditioning on my part, Absolutely. so to speak. It has a lot to do with culture norms and, you know, being from the South, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, be as conservative, Absolutely. be as together. Cover up. And right. Exactly. And so that contributed a lot to it, I imagine. And then also, too, you know, breasts are seen as, uh, you know, Sex objects? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, you know, you know what I mean. Well, I, think, right. I, think, I think clearly we live in a very puritanical society. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. the idea that you would see a breast, kind of the, the fact that we're so aroused by the sight of a breast is, is ridiculous. I mean, if you think about uh, even the awards ceremony where someone's nipple showed and how, how much oh, coverage wow. yeah. that right. got. Right, right, right. right. So, right. so really, as a society, we have to understand the, the, the very essential part of breast. So as a man, I'm pleased to support the idea and to provide a reasonable accommodation for women returning back to work where they can either express milk and store it or nurse their children. Um, when this whole idea of first foods came about mm -hmm. uh, and, and nutrition, so we fight really hard from a city council perspective to make sure that there's a, a not food deserts for underserved communities. And I'm thinking to myself, while we're doing that, the most natural first food is being overlooked. 
Absolutely. So the ability from a, a public policy perspective to get that in order and to begin a natural uh, nutritional uh, uh, track seemed the easiest thing to do. So I, no, I'm pleased I to do that. You. I would just add, though, that while we are thinking about that, we have to keep in mind what is available in our communities because the breast milk is created by, you know, is based a lot on what the mother is putting into her body. Right, so and we've how much come she has at available it. Right. to use. Right, right. 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 So, so, so that, that means also making sure that she is staying healthy and that she exactly. is making and sure that, that she is available. So that, that you're passing through the right. nutrients in, in a healthy well, way. Well, that, and that's the perfect thing about connecting it. You know, we talk about, we've heard in Brooklyn especially about food justice, you know, mm -hmm. and, and right. it's kind of the first food justice piece to it as well, that every woman should feel comfortable to breastfeed her, and it's New York State law, actually, mm -hmm. that a woman is allowed to, it's her right to breastfeed anywhere that she chooses, and that employers also need to provide space. But do police protect that right? Meaning, aren't there instances where women will be asked to remove themselves from establishments, but yet we, it's your right? I mean, we, it's we know so, there are instances, right. instances where that happens, but that a lot has to do with what education is out there, mm -hmm. the culture of what they're used to, and what people know. And so, you know, our and, role and people feeling empowered to be able to, to stand speak up, up on that. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Yeah. This is my right, and I have absolutely. the right, right. To do this here. And that's the goal of the breastfeeding empowerment zone. But mm -hmm. we can. No, add. I, I have to tell you that when I started looking into this and thinking about this whole situation, it disturbed me a great deal because it would occur all of us were born. I mean, all of us have been in that situation where we were little and we had to, um, parents fed us and nursed us. It has to be one of the most important things that happens to us. And to get the proper nutrition in the beginning makes such a difference in the way that children grow and develop that I don't see that we have a society that supports that, that supports making it as easy as possible for parents to go back to work because they have to mm -hmm. and still be able to take care of their children. I'm gonna tell you, I didn't nurse my daughter. And when you were talking just now, that came back to me. I was afraid, I knew I had to go back to work. I was afraid that it would be inconvenient for me. And as a result, I've regretted it. So, And so a lot of it has to do with the education, the Absolutely. community, and how breastfeeding is, is it respected, is it embraced, is it promoted? If that happens, then you're going to, you're gonna, you're gonna get on board. Absolutely. You're gonna be a part of. You know, because I'm thinking about it too. I breastfed because of my sister who had a baby a year before I did breastfed, mm -hmm. you know, and was talking about all the benefits. So let's talk a little bit about this, uh, this empowerment zone. Well, changing culture, essentially. Well, You're changing we're, we're just glad to a community be a, culture. Yes. We're glad in my office to be a part of the, the empowerment zone. And, and as a component to that, we've been able to provide, like I said, you know, my office had a chance. As a legislator, you get a chance to do two things. You either legislate or you model. We mm -hmm. actually had a chance to do both. Oh, wonderful. So yes. we had a chance to follow the state legislation that you've mentioned for reasonable accommodation for returning and around the state. We have the first office. Uh, the first public lactation station in city in the city, now, talk, not just in city so government. So, what is a public lactation station? A public for lactation those who station may means that no matter where you are in Central Brooklyn, if you have the need or urge to nurse or express milk, mm -hmm. so we, we extended it past just nursing. When you right, need, you right. may need to express. Right. right. So, so <laughs> for for here in Central Brooklyn, if you're if you're enjoying a, an afternoon with your family at at Food Town shopping mm -hmm. or at Applebee's or in the Billy Holiday Theater, you can leave if you fit and we don't we're not saying that people should leave to come and use it but if you feel comfortable doing that you should we believe that you should nurse in place mm. so wherever you are if you're on the nurse bus you shouldn't place. have to get off the 25 or the 26 oh, right. to come and upstairs to nurse and it's your absolute right it, but but it may become convenient it right so but as 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 the, as the social <laughs> norms begin to evolve and yes. change sure. there'll be more of that but in the interim we wanted to provide a safe quiet clean space to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I gotta be honest, mine came out of the fact that my wife, who nursed our children, um, was frowned upon as someone as a, you know, in a community who wanted to um, uh, have some stance and prominence in the community. Her husband and I, we were, we were in a leadership role and were kind of uh, not encouraged to continue that practice if we were gonna be in the public eye. Mm -hmm. Which anybody who knows my wife knows that now she probably wanted to have more children just so she could nurse. <laughs> to, to prove, prove her point. To prove right? her point. Her point. And six children exactly. later, she was able to, so. Um, so that's a very important thing. It is very important. And, 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 it's really the, the role of leadership, and as far as the empowerment zone, which I will say it's funded by the Kellogg Foundation because that's important, mm -hmm. but the idea is that we're taking the zip code of Bed-Stuy and 
working on multiple levels of saturating the message so that we can change the norm. So we are fortunate to have the leadership of the councilman because that's very unique actually across the country. Um, mm -hmm. But we're also working with retail. So we're working with the business and the bids because uh, there is actually a business case for breastfeeding that the former Surgeon General Regina Benjamin created. Uh, she created a toolkit for that, but we're also working with the faith-based organizations. And we have created a faith-based organization breastfeeding toolkit. And we're working on training folks within, and it's not only not just churches, but also mosques and synagogues within the bed area. Dr. Maybank, what is in the toolkit? Well, the toolkit has, um, it's, it's a folder, and it has a list of ways and steps that the institutions can take or make in order to start implementing it. So they have posters that create signage that they can put up, but they also even provide messages that they can put into their bulletins or they can say from the pulpit if it's pulpit. But it's not just churches, again, it's also mosques and synagogues. But it's important to remember that we actually spend time with the faith institution beforehand. We don't just hand over the, the toolkit and expect them to, to do what they gotta do. And so, yeah, it takes, it takes some conversation. Right. Um, and we also provide, you know, fans. We provide blankets. We provide, blankets. Uh, cool. right. we provide um, a screen as well if, if the institution, you know, wants a screen in order to put some somewhere. But some faith institutions are definitely on the front line and, and saying, no, mom can breastfeed right into the, in the sanctuary if she wants to and chooses mm -hmm. to. But it's, it's a good process. And I think that the whole idea of the empowerment zone is just working on these multiple levels. And what are some of the other things that the empowerment zone uh, brings to the community? Right, so the retail piece that I mentioned, we're actually working here with, um, with uh, ShopRite, Shop, Food no, Foodtown, Food Town. oh my Food goodness. Town. Food Thanks Town. for getting that right. I know, no, I know. No <laughs> <laughs> I know, for, with Food Town, um, and they're going to be putting breastfeeding signs up. So we have this sign called Breastfeeding is Welcome Here. Right. So the idea is that any retail setting, any business setting to put in the window so that it becomes branded that breastfeeding is welcome here. And so we're doing that with Food Town. We're going to be doing that with um, the restaurant right here, Applebee's as well. So can, right. can I just make an admission? Yeah. I like this. I like what mm -hmm. I'm hearing. But I am going to tell you that, you know, as someone who breastfed 16 and 12 years ago and had to cover up. I feel like, you know, like when I do see a woman who isn't covered up, I personally, I have to go, oh, okay, that's where we are. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Like, you know, it's not a negative, right. but it's like I right. have to remind myself, that's oh, we've we are. evolved. We've, that's we've where on. we are. We've, yeah, and I imagine we've, there are a lot of people out there who feel the same. I, I yeah. have to, sh I share the exact same sentiments, you know? Right. Of course, because I covered up or I didn't do it in, out in public, but right. society is moving along. Right. Right. And, and is part of this also because of the fact that you've got a broad immigrant community here too as well? Well, part, really the, the goal of the empowerment zone was that there was a racial equity, inequity mm -hmm. you know, that existed and that black and Latino uh, communities just weren't breastfeeding longer for many different reasons. There were so many mm -hmm. conversations. I've heard it, even WIC, you know, who is one of the largest mm -hmm. formula providers mm -hmm. in this country, recipients of WIC, and I've, I've heard women say this, that you know, they, their moms received WIC you know, when, when they were growing up, so they're entitled to get WIC. Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't they wow. have formula? So it's right. really and just back, it's back to that entitlement right. thing and, and, I, and, and income issues. Sort of. And, and mm -hmm. the, the income issues, mm -hmm. and, but as you know, the councilman said, there are so many economic advantages, and if you think right. about emergency Absolutely. preparedness, right. you will wow. definitely will have, have breast milk, right. and, and, and so it's, I think we have to frame and the, the message in, in a way that meets people where they're they at. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about you know, infant mortality in this particular community. Mm -hmm. what, what role or how did that work into this whole area of the empowerment zone? I'm sure the data is not in, mm -hmm. in terms of if it's not making yet. a difference, right. but isn't that part, what, was that a consideration, of course, I would imagine? Absolutely, I mean, mm -hmm. when we talk about breastfeeding, we're talking about the wellness of the family, you know, right, and the right. wellness of the child and the context of family so that if we're starting to have conversations about breastfeeding and how do you take care of them and we're engaging men in that process and they're becoming part right. of leadership, right. that really just helps provide support all around. You talked about, you know, you had a lot of support. Support is a big reason, a, a deal breaker really, if moms are able to breastfeed or not. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that you, you, you 
create environments where people feel comfortable doing it openly, mm -hmm. then they gain support from others. They, they see role models, like people become role models for them mm -hmm. who otherwise might not. But I also right. wanted to add, though, that the consistent messaging and when all stakeholders are on the same page, so even, even having yeah. the hospitals decrease the amount of accessibility to formula yeah. mm -hmm. to young mothers who are, who are just having, you know, that, that was almost like that a seems drug. Scary you're giving in a way, them, you're giving that people is, is so that much not, for Is that free. not scary? But, 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 but I'm just wondering. To support, so if we're, right. we're not just taking it away right. without right. providing them the guidance. But, but it's, right. it's, 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 you know, the way that they did it, I know when my wife was in the hospital, it was so free and accessible. You know, and then you get out in the, in the right. real world with your child and it's right. expensive. Right. Right. But, right. but they almost, you know, kind of, they don't force it on you, but it's so right. free and accessible. And there are some hospitals where they withhold the formula. You know, where they don't want the mother, they want the right. mother to breastfeed. But that's where that inequity is, because in communities of color, it's the exactly. opposite. Right. That's, oh, what, that's exactly, exactly what, what I'm saying. saying. What you're New York saying. City, the New York City Department of Health, and we've really taken a lead in this, and so we have a program called Latch, Latch On. on. Yeah, the Latch on. And it's a voluntary program in which we've asked the hospitals mm -hmm. to actually to think through their practices of just providing formula right off the bat, you know, and to not have it initially, but to really support, and as you mentioned, to make sure that there is counseling available at all given times so that they can actually encourage moms to breastfeed, support moms to breastfeed while they're in the hospital. And we have, you know, a lot of hospitals have signed on. We definitely could get more. Um, but, you know, there are definitely challenges with that as well, to, to be honest. The message is out there, and we're clear what we want to support. But sometimes you have to think about staff and where staffing is right. at, you know, Absolutely. and we have different right. hospitals from what their cultural background right. is and how supportive. So it's, you know, it's a process. And I, um, I have to share this mm -hmm. story, too, because I, I went to Litch and it, I had to, I had a nurse educator who was there with me almost nonstop mm -hmm. because she just liked the fact that I was so passionate about nursing. Yeah. And it took a while to understand how to do it. It wasn't right. as natural as I thought it would be right. for the first child. Right. The second child, absolutely no problem. But I would say it took a good six weeks. My sister would say, that seems to be the worst time between you and your son right there. One of the challenges that we have to bring forward. Yes. And that is that you know many perceive breastfeeding, many in, many in our community, as something that holds you back. You know, mm -hmm. if you're breastfeeding, then you can't get out and get back on with your life. And, and that's something that we also have to work through, Absolutely. sometimes especially with younger parents. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I want to get back out there, and so the formula, so-and-so can it's take convenient. care of my baby. Right, right. exactly. And, and so that's when the, the, the pumping and the expressing your milk right. and helping them to appreciate, yeah, you, you can you still can go and do what you want to do. I right. wonder about right. teen moms or young moms, you know, mm -hmm. what you're, uh, right to your point, you know, you can express the milk and, and that can help with that, but p mothers need to understand the kind of bonding that is created. You know, bonding. what are the benefits? Talk to us a little bit about the benefits, because we're going to help yeah. sell this program. Okay, okay. Let's there's, a, there's a concern, though, um, about how fathers in the initial stages of a child's life don't get to participate. And that, you know, I don't know if that's an excuse for, that's for it, it, but it's been, so when we have our support conversations as men, that often comes up as, you know, what do we do? We're kind of standing on the sidelines, oh, that's waiting right. for an opportunity to, right. to, to, right. to, to be with the patient. Yes. the value of expressing the milk so that Absolutely. then the father Absolutely. can still be able to feed the child's bib. Yeah, and the nobody's, nobody's gonna wear that. Here, <laughs> here, here. nobody's gonna like, wear that. Nobody. And so he's like, I'm supposed to express the milk, and then he's supposed to put on this bib and like hold it up here. And he's yeah. like, oh, no, I, I, I will I feed the baby. Like, but. I, I had instances <laughs> where my son, my husband would hold him, and he'd go, you know, right. they call it Rudy, yeah. and I'm like, hey, man, stop, stop, right. stop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the benefit, yeah. No, no, yeah. but that is yes. a benefit, Rudy. I think, also on yeah. the family side of it as well, right. you know, and, and it's... the family, not mm -hmm. just the mother. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely, but I think the bonding that happens not just yes. with mother and child, but the mm -hmm. opportunity for it to happen with everybody, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, your family structure is. Mm -hmm. uh, but benefits, mm -hmm. obesity, uh, we know for both childhood obesity as well as for the mother, we know mm -hmm. the, the, her weight can go down. Um, postpartum depression, another um, big uh, outcome. Bonding, as you said. There are a lot of benefits also for women that people don't realize, and one of them is, and we're getting more and more research about this, is the decrease in ovarian and certain types of breast really? cancer. Yes, right? I, yes, yes. And so I think mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that, you know, in the emergency preparedness and the economic benefits, but there are and multiple. I was sharing with you when I 
was breastfeeding my daughter, there were reports coming out saying that uh, breastfeeding can contribute to greater brain development. Yes, and, I remember that. Um, yes. Greater memorization skills. Right. And then the other thing was that um, the way that the nipple is positioned in the mouth, it helps with teeth formation mm -hmm. and can, uh, can promote greater teeth, like healthier teeth mm -hmm. and greater formation. And so I was sharing that my daughter has perfect teeth and they didn't pay a whole lot of money for them. <laughs> and she's got excellent memorization skills. And it was two years of breastfeeding. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, but definitely. Is it, is that, I gotta ask but you, mine. is it true? Because we went on the premise no. that also in, uh, as a health, uh, as a positive health outcome, uh, there were less ear infections. So there were less, less ear infections. Ear My daughter never had an ear infection. Never right, had right. one. Right, right. So yeah. it yeah. infects, yeah. so I was right. going to say, the immunity mm -hmm. piece is also right. very, very big, important. And it right. helps the immune system. Especially so the first two weeks I was hearing, or the first yeah. six weeks. It, it, it was like, if you can't do because any other breastfeeding, right, that's the most right, important yeah. time. Because that's when a lot of the immunity mm -hmm. aspects of mother's breast milk is really passed through those first weeks. And so even allergies and... Um, eczema, all of those we know, eczema. definitely children are mm -hmm. less likely to suffer from those issues when they are breastfed. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about, has this caught on, this whole empowerment zone? I think, you know, as with anything, whether it's a negative campaign or a positive campaign, there, there's a consistency that's necessary to get a message across. Mm -hmm. And I think that now it's gaining momentum, so other people are signing on, including, including men. So I think, no, has it reached where we'd like the outcome to be? Right but I think it's on the road to that. When you have all stakeholders in the community, you know, when you have your businesses, mm -hmm. when, you have, when you have men, women, um, and everybody churches. really, and churches, and <laughs> right. I, I was reluctant to bring that up because we right. have some work to do within yes. the church. Right. Um, but when you have all little stakeholders, then it becomes an eventuality and it's just a natural progression and it's a, it becomes a behavior. And so, we're supporting women in the home as well. You know, there are, right. so we have kind of beefed up in a sense, I don't know if that's the right word, but right. increase, um, our level of providing home services. So our newborn home visiting program, we also have our doula program. So they're all, right. it, the idea is in order for an empowerment zone, it's like a, an empowerment zone, an economic empowerment zone, you have to saturate the area. You have to really get the message out on multiple levels. We'll be working with media as well okay. and probably doing a campaign for men. Dr. Maybank, talk to us about the Pregnancy Fairness Act. Right, so it was passed in New York City this, this year. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is really to help prevent pregnancy discrimination. So, mm -hmm. and, and it's one of those, I think about, well, why wouldn't we think about this beforehand? But really what it provides is the woman, if she's pregnant, the opportunity to have more breaks um, mm -hmm. at her work and not get penalized for, for doing so. If she is in an environment in which she's standing all day, that she has access to a stool. Uh, so it's really providing spaces and accommodation for a pregnant woman for, so her life is, is easier. I'm reading a book uh, called Lean In by uh, Sheryl Sandberg. Mm -hmm. And the way she starts off the book was about how she never think, as women, we don't even realize how difficult it is for us on a day-to-day -day basis, because oh, you don't? talk, we, well, sometimes, oh, it becomes unconscious. It, it becomes okay. unco there's some level of unconsciousness right. that yeah. comes about we it. Just, we just accept about, it. Right. Absolutely, because she talks about how it. she was pregnant, how she would have to go so far in the parking lot. And then it was her husband one day, he said, well, why don't you ask for her to have a pregnancy space close by? That. Because that other company does that. Yeah, so it's, there's a lot that we have yeah. internalized. Uh, that it's, it, and I think of these acts in this empowerment zone is about how do we empower ourselves? Now, do you think businesses, are, are they willing to take pregnant women on? Meaning, you know, anytime you ask a business to do a little more to accommodate, there's always the risk that they find other ways to not participate. Well, I, I definitely feel like that's the challenge, but the reality okay. is that this is, this is the act and this is the law, you Absolutely. know, and there are some protections out there now mm -hmm. for women. And does it... Um, does it be matter based on size of business, or is it any business? It's for, actually, four employees or more, I believe, is what the, the law states. So if you're a business with four or more employees, then this law this applies, law applies and, to and, and it's worded in a way, it's, it's a reasonable accommodation. Right. So mm -hmm. there's an expectation that if it's reasonable, mm -hmm. the, same they, the same way we have a reasonable accommodation for women who are expressing milk. So you have right. to provide an environment, you have right. to provide enough break time, you have to provide um, not to lift heavy boxes if that's yeah. part of your job. Right. And the reason it's four and above is because it's unreasonable that if you have that smaller work staff that you could de uh, you know, differentiate between right. the type of work. Right. So it's right. a little harder to do when it's, when when it's, it's, when it's under. I was actually, I gotta be honest, that the author of that law is a man, mm -hmm. Jimmy Baca, and I was proud to stand with him. And it actually inspired me to do, I gotta be honest, Jimmy inspired me to do what I'm doing because as a man, he took that stance. Mm -hmm. um, and we all stood with him and around that legislation. Um, and, we, and I just felt like it needed to go a little further 
uh, for women who had already uh, given birth. They need a reasonable accommodation and as well. So it sounds like we are doing many things to change culture around breastfeeding. What can ordinary people do that can just re help to reinforce this message? Right. I, well, when you see a woman breastfeeding, give a thumbs up. Yeah, you, hey, I mean, yeah, you know, but be as supportive as right, you possibly can. Recognize your own personal right. reaction because we all have personal reactions to it yeah. because we all are not comfortable sometimes seeing it. But recognize that and kind of, you know, step away. If you're an employer, learn the policies, mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. the laws as we've been doing the Know Your Rights workshops Absolutely. with employers. Uh, to, That's very for, important. Yeah, yes. for them to understand what are, exactly are the laws and how to help them implement the laws into the spaces that they have. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I think the more conversation that we all have about it, that's open, that's honest, I, the better it is. I see a lot of posts on Facebook, which is also a great thing, I think, and a great medium for having this conversation. Right. And, mm -hmm. and it really brings out where we are. But you know, when a ball player's wife, which was recently this year, posts a picture of her breastfeeding and there's all this shock and all, but right. it, and at first people are like, well, how could, you know, why are they upset with her? But I said, you know what, this is a good moment this for conversation. This is how change occurs. Absolutely. This is how change occurs. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode, but this was really informative. Thank you so much, Dr. Maybank. And wait, wait. Before, yes. before you that's close, right, there is, yes, okay, close, that's right. You, you asked if I thought that this was working. That's and, absolutely and right. From, from, and, I, and I didn't say that there are several offices on a city, state, and federal level who've reached out to us mm -hmm. to find out how to do that. The district attorney's awesome. office, Ken Thompson, big shout out to him, mm -hmm. who's now going to be implementing that, and our borough president is also uh, carving out a space to do it as well. It's so, moving. So it's, it's moving. So it's working. So, Yes, we oh, are. Oh, those are two Brooklyn electors, oh, right? Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> Brooklyn is on board. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, that's all the time we have for this episode. Thank you, Aletha, for, okay. for joining us. <laughs> and Councilman Carnegie, My thank pleasure. you so much. And thank your wife, Michelle, yes. for yes. being that woman that is out there making a difference. She's not the boss of me. <laughs> <laughs> we will see you next time on Brooklyn Savvy.